had to give a singular headline, it's that consumers are lost in the sauce. Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook, presented by Details Interactive, Imperity, and Element. Here, you'll take away three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number 92, and today's guest is Allie Wing. Allie and I first met when she was running a business that she had founded called Giggle. She's one of 10 children, a diverse family that helped forge her future direction. She spent time with Nike helping on the acquisition of Colhan. She went back to school to obtain a dual JD MBA degree. And today she's the CEO at a company called Oobly that is helping to create a new product category called Sweet Proteins. You can check that out at oobly.com, spelled O-O-B-L-I.com. Before we get started, a quick thank you, as always, to Max Brandstetter of the Wild wow Business Growth Podcast for producing this episode. You can reach him at max at maxpodcasting.com to help bring your podcast to life. Let's open the playbook. Ready, break. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Marketing Playbook Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ali Wing, a seasoned executive, board member, advisor, and company leader Allie recently served as the CCO of Bright Health before joining Oobly as CEO. Allie's career has spanned consumer goods, retail, and technology as a brand leader at companies including Giggle and Nike. Allie also serves as an independent director for Casey's General Stores and Worldwide Orphans. She's a customer-centric executive with a track record of entrepreneurship, brand strategy, and growth leadership. And in Allie's words, I've spent my career at the intersection of technology and healthy living, working on ways to solve big consumer problems. So when the team approached me about commercializing Oobly, I jumped at the opportunity. Why? Because sweet proteins, and we're going to hear a lot about sweet proteins today, may be the most disruptive solution for rehabilitating our modern food system that I've ever seen. Delicious, great for the planet, affordable, plus a sweets and health game changer. Who knew protein could do more than build muscle? Sweet tooth, meat, sweet proteins. Allie, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's so nice to be here. And it's great to see you. And uh, I know, you know, like many, you're very busy. So really appreciate you carving out some time to spend it with me. Awesome. I'm happy to do it. It's great to reconnect. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting to have you uh, on the show today talking about sweet proteins, something I knew nothing about until I read up on what you've been doing. I did have the CEO of nuts.com on the show very recently. And, uh, you know, she was talking about all the, the, the good products that they do uh, there. So, and I have a sweet tooth, so uh, this is going to be fun. So as my listeners know, we start off the show all the time uh, trying to get that first story from the guest, where you grew up, uh, and was there something in your upbringing that suggested that you might have the kind of a career, uh, and yours has been very varied, I might add, uh, the kind of career that you've had? I am a small town kid from Bozeman, Montana, and I'm one of 10 kids. Um, but the really interesting facts about that are that the generation ahead of me were all farmers in Northern California, and my dad is the only one in that generation that got a college degree. And he and my mom, he had this love of the parklands, but got a college degree, and they wanted to help kids. So I'm one of 10 kids, but six are adopted. We come from five different ethnic backgrounds. So I grew up kind of almost the case study of consumerism. But with a dad and kind of the one role model that was professional, never willing to compromise what he was going to do with his career, with what his passion or missions were in the world. And I think when you kind of, when I step back and look at where I've spent my time, it's funny, Mark, because you and I met it. The only one time I've ever stepped away from the intersection of healthy and technology. And when I was working with Asina and doing retail, just straight up retail, which I'd never done. I think now when I look back, I think a lot about, I don't think I realized it at all then that my dad left a big imprint on me about um, not compromising why I wake up each day in addition to sort of how I'm going to feed my family and making sure I bring those worlds together. And that largely characterizes my career, I think. 
Great background, 10 kids, different diverse backgrounds. Uh, very interesting. So you you go to college, uh, you come out of undergrad and Nike really early on. Was that the first role out of college, Nike? To be honest with you, it was really in college. So I was kind of the small town kid from Montana. So the definition of going to college was who's going to pay me to go to college. So I ended up, you either went to Montana State or you got a scholarship. And I was a debater and I got a scholarship that sent me my first year and a half overseas, um, basically studying the Cold War because I had been a debater. And But it put me into Lewis and Clark, a little small liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon, with a full ride to be a debater for them midway through college. I was enough of a hungry student, starving student, right? Um, I didn't have a lot of extra money. So I waitressed at night through college. And very early in my career, the head of my international economics department was a guy named Joe Ha, who was one of the senior executives at Nike. I started waiting tables on him. He was also the head of my department. He put the two together and said, she's one of my best students. She's hardworking. I could pay her better and she could do more for me at Nike. So I started working on um, Korean manufacturing projects for him my first year at Lewis and Clark. And then he sent me overseas during the summer and paid me well, which I appreciated. And he came out. And at that time, I still thought I was going to go solve the Cold War. I had already applied to Johns Hopkins. I was going to get a master's in international relations. And to this day, I still go back and give him a ton of credit because he sat me down right at the end of my senior year. And he said, boy, if I've ever met a business person, I'm looking at it. Uh, you like to build. You're good at it. Nike loves you. I think you should defer and work for a while and just chew on it a little bit before you build your career. And they said to me, what do you want to come do? And I said, well, you're known for brand. And the rest is history. I fell in love with building brands. Wow, that's so interesting. That's not a story that I've heard on this show uh, before. Um, and during that time at Nike, you also were involved in some of the M&A work. You were involved in the Kohan uh, acquisition? I was. You know, Nike, when I was there, if you think about it, uh, late 80s, early 90s, was very... It was like a startup with a lot of cash. And don't get me wrong, we weren't little, but like I was there before we moved into the world headquarters. I was in the first building that moved into the world headquarters. In fact, little known fun fact is I was the first ever employee of the month in the new campus. We were big in that we were multi-millions, but we weren't what Nike is today. We were growing at triple digit rates. So it's funny now that I'm much older and can do the compare, the kind of growth rates we were experiencing were closer to a startup. And we were making those kind of almost startup bets. So when I was there, I started out in brand. And believe it or not, I was part of the team that introduced what we all now take for granted, but there was no Nike women's. So what became <laughs> Nike women's? And we were still struggling with this idea that how come if we just hired Steffi Graf, women didn't just buy our shoes. So maybe there was a different motivator. So it was an interesting time, great consumer journey. But the guy that had really influenced me my first couple of years there, and he had done some of the work when I was in the Korean manufacturing work, they were building their first ever kind of what we'd call today corp dev team. And that's when they were figuring out, were they going to be a retailer? Um, how are they were going to think about Europe? How are they going to be a global brand versus an international company with U.S. offices or brand, U.S. brand with international offices? And he became the guy who led it. So he plucked me over and said, you can think like this, come work on these projects with me. We are a brand company, so they're inherently brand. You won't be walking that, but they're kind of our big, how do we scale the company? So from M&A to how we set ourselves up globally, because it was kind of EEC 92 years, and we were thinking about maybe you can't have just 10 independent offices that are sales offices. You need a regional brand presence. And when I was at Nike, it was the first time we became a billion dollar soccer player. So that was a big deal. I was in Europe for them for a while, for about a year and a half. Those were kind of the meaty projects. The last one I did for them where before I really left, which I consider a core brand thing, but it was when we were evaluating brand, what we all call as Nike retail today, but it was really Nike towns and it was a marketing concept. It was a brand concept. And we were exploring what that meant to be in channels. Again, now that almost sounds like what we take for granted, but I was, I think, in one of the very first Foot Locker meetings where we said, don't worry, it's not going to be retail. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be um, this museum <laughs> um, that we also happen to sell things in. So, and fast forward to what we all know, that was the beginning of brands versus channels, um, which has had a huge imprint on my career. I, I am very much, and if you really look at the things I've done, you can see it, you kind of, kind of can see the thread of what I've done more too is 
I've always been a brand first, not channel. I've done every channel. So I don't really think of the world as channels. I think of those as just tools. I think of the world as what's the consumer problem and what's the proposition and how do we best optimize that? Um, and that's kind of where I've always found my sweet spot. Uh, lots of folks uh, that I've mentored and, and tried to advise over the years, you know, when they're early in their career, they have this decision to make, you know, do we continue to go forward on the path? Uh, do we take a break and go back to school, get an MBA, maybe get a JD? You did something like that. I did. And I, uh, some people would say my, my, my older siblings would say, you know, overachiever, always have to do more than one, right? Double majors, double degrees, whatever. Maybe it's indecision. Maybe I think I like to think of it as life is an end of one. There's so many good things to do. How do you choose? Um, but truthfully, the the real answer was I'm even though my dad has a college degree in a lot of ways, I think people, we have a tendency in consumers in America right now, kind of our moment to think of you know, what's your personal story? I mean, I'll talk about the immigrant story. But if you come off of kind of farming heritage in the US, even if it's multi-generational, it's a lot of the same pressures as people talk about when their families came from another country. And in my family's view, I very much remember going to tell my dad I was going to go to graduate school and him saying, an MBA, like who would spend money on something like that? If you're going to go, you better be able to hang a shingle after. Like, so it's medicine or it's law. And I really had such respect for my dad and it was very self-made cool guy um, that I was like, I was never going to present to him just an MBA. So I think truthfully, it was a bit of a hedge with my family and the generational expectations of being one of the older ones. Fast forward, and I will say, I knew I needed to go back because my undergraduate hadn't been focused on business at all. So it was good for me to go to MB get a business degree, go through the finance classes, make sure I understood the P&Ls, do the accounting classes. Not that you don't learn them on the job too, you do. Because of that, what I did in law was corporate securities. And so that combined, I was very focused on how do you leverage the capital side of what you do um, while you're building businesses. And fast forward many years later, and I'm really glad I did both. It was a luxury to get to do both. Um, and I'm surprised how much I actually enjoyed the law too, even though I didn't stay for very long. Right. So you practiced uh, as an attorney for a few years and then you know, ultimately moved into a more retail consumer branding focused career. I did. It wasn't a direct line to retail per se, but it definitely was back to brand and consumer. It's more that, so when I was coming out of graduate school, even though I'd grown up mostly in Montana when I was 17, I graduated a year early and my parents moved back to California because there's about a four year gap between me and the next kid. And they, my brothers and sister needed more of the resources of California um, as they were going through high school with all their different backgrounds and languages. And so my parents moved back. So at that point I'd lived almost 15 years away and out of state from my family. So they were all back in California. So I had some motivation to get West. That was number one. Number two was, I didn't know that I wanted to go build per se, but I knew I had fallen in love with this idea of innovation. And there was a little thing happening in the Silicon Valley called technology and innovation. And when I was in graduate school, my marketing, because I had such a strong marketing background practically, I focused on what's called dis decision sciences. And it was really behavioral sort of economics and modeling, which was kind of the precursor to everything digital, which was pretty awesome timing for me. So I figured the best way for me to combine all that was the Silicon Valley, which is why I went out and did that practice. So I just was partnered with growth companies. I represented half my practice was um, venture capitalists and half of them were startups. And the reason I left, not a huge surprise, I really quickly figured out I wanted to create the deals, not facilitate them legally, was because a couple of my clients were venture capitalists and they were like, you know, we basically have a, a stable of technologies that are trying to figure out how to build a revenue model <laughs> and what the consumer really needs. And you're sitting here understanding both sides, get back on the business side. So the next five years, I kind of acted, we would call it today more of an entrepreneur in residence. They didn't really call them fractional then, um, but I was kind of an entrepreneur in residence for two different VCs and they would pluck me in, partner me usually with a founder and I would help them pick apart the business and figure out where really was the proposition. How do you make money at it? How do you raise money and how do you build growth? And that's what I did multiple times before I then became a founder. Thriving brands today have one thing in common. They make it a priority to understand their customers. Imparity uses AI to unify customer data and help businesses know exactly who their customers are and what they care about most. 
find new customers, grow loyalty, get better return on ad spend, and manage privacy compliance. An accurate, unified customer data foundation connected with the teams and tools that need it makes everything you do with customer data work better. Build your strategy on Amparity, the platform for customer data. Learn more at Amparity.com. Yeah, so let's use that as a good segue into uh, being a founder. So in in actuality, I met you for the first time while you were at Giggle. And every time I, I remember typing Giggle and I would immediately type Google. <laughs> the greatest error you could make. <laughs> but I, I met you uh, there. Tell everybody about Giggle and, you know, what problem you saw in the marketplace, right? You've talked about, you know, the uh, problem and solution for the customers. What was the problem you were trying to solve and the experience that you had doing that? So I always had this personal bias. Again, it was influenced by Nike, but I grew up that way. You could say my parents were kind of farm to table before anybody had a language for that, right? Like, so we always kind of had that home eating philosophy. Then I went off to Nike and it was all about sports and performance, but lots of conversation about health. Then I came out to the Silicon Valley and everyone's talking about what has to change in the world. But what was happening in the backdrop around me on that was Whole Foods. And if you go back to that time, Whole Foods was growing leaps and bounds. And it was the first time we were kind of redefining for the consumer access to this idea of healthy living that didn't have to be crunchy or granola. It could be kind of premium and branded and specialty. But if you got under the hood and one of the companies that I was doing a fractional work for pulled me in and I got to see all of this. The really interesting part of Whole Foods was what was happening in the non, was in the kids aisle. Those were growing at two to three times the rate of any other aisle. And if you think about it, and Mark, you're a longtime marketing person, so you know, I'm going to use brand speak for a minute. What was interesting is, think about it, what's the greatest brand extension we have as humans or as consumers? It's our children, right? There are little mini brand extensions. We put every, we equip them with the accoutrement of everything we value. And so it's not a surprise that in things like, Whole Foods, we were we were better at preaching, sort of making sure our kids didn't have sugar and things, but we still snuck our Oreos and put them in our pantries, right? Because we we were the generation, that generation of early parents, I wasn't a parent yet, that was sort of bridging that and saying, wow, there should be a better way I should think about this differently. I'll do it for sure for my kids, right? Why I get in there. So I started getting really fascinated with this from a project that I did as a fractional role and I started looking at the hypothesis of business models out there. And obviously, this was the very beginning of the internet. So, of course, I always thought about this as omni-channel, which was early and new, right? We were kind of early clicks and bricks. But the, the closest model I would say I was mimicking was Chuck Williams' original Williams Sonoma model. And here's the analogy I'll give you. And you get this as, a, as somebody who's been in retail a long time. That was like the beginning of area of specialty, the Chuck Williams time, right? The Williams Sonoma, right? When specialty started its heyday, which has largely been squeezed out with disintermediation today. Um, but what he did that was so great, it wasn't like you couldn't buy kitchen stuff at, at a hardware store or at Macy's, but he'd never taken it and made it an edit where he kind of created the expert, the average Joe. So who were the experts that Williams Sonoma won on and where did the power of their machine happen? As you transition to marriage, as you transition through wedding, you actually then set up a kitchen and you suddenly became expert chefs and you kind of took on the accoutrement of cooking and you had a point of view about it as you hosted first people. That was very much that era. And what he did was kind of magical because he turned it on its head and made the everyday person feel like the expertise could be accessible. And my hypothesis was you had this kind of same inefficiency going on with parenting where everybody goes through the cycle and everybody's a novice going through it and everybody's seeking expertise, but really your only choices of shopping were very mass where it's overwhelming set of choices, right? Or super luxury gifting, not really the practicality. And so very similar model was how do you take a better specialty educated edit to that and then what would you do to bring that into a modern distribution, which is why we started digital and then added stores. Um, and that was how it started. That was the beginning. And that was very similar to my very first piece of paper pitch, right? What I remember um, of seeing that brand online and even at your offices, it just looked like fun. And it looked like the people that were there were having fun. It was. I mean, I'd like to think that we named, <laughs> be bad if we weren't when we named ourselves Giggle. But I used to always say people from the outside in would say, oh, it's a baby business. And I would say, no, we're, we're not. We're actually a new parent business. 
And what's the greatest gift that parenting gives you? It gives you the giggle again, right? Like at some point, as you get older and educated, you go off, you have dinners and you do all this adult stuff, you kind of quit playing. And the great gift, if you get past all the stress of, did I pick the right stroller? Did I get the right car seat? Did I get the right nutrition? Is you get the joy, right? You get the giggle that comes from them. That's where the name came from. And I'd like to think, yeah, we were building that culture. So you, you go from your entrepreneurial time at Giggle and you go back into a corporate role uh, at a multi-title, multi-brand retailer called Asina. How was that transition back into corporate for you? Well, let me tell you why I did it. There's a little context to it and then the good parts of it. And then why I also knew I needed to get back into innovation, right? So I, you know, after a little over four years, I knew that was enough for me. The why was... My build with Giggle had both wins and losses, right? Um, I didn't know I planned to be a founder. I think you happen into that. But suddenly I found myself going through the 2008 crash. And we had just rolled out. I had built a very successful product line. I know one of um, you and I had talked earlier that you probably didn't realize about a third of our products were ours. So that product line was very successful and we had sold that. Then I went into retail expansion because the brand was starting to be big enough. And we deployed a huge expansion that year before the crash. And it was complicated managing through that as disintermediation was happening so rapidly. So much so that my primary investors who were private equity dissolved during it. And I became a direct investment of a hedge fund, also very complicated. So what I don't talk about as much, but I will say, I was also going through personal stuff. My dad passed away suddenly. Um, my husband ended up with a health scare. So there was a lot going on in a really complicated time. And when I made a decision that was time for me to move on from that, take my equity, step back, let them do the next stage, I needed to take a break. And I also was really tired of the capital part of what it meant to build companies. So I happened at the time, and you'll, this will make more sense now, to get approached by Asina because of Justice, the kids brand. But, you know, having just spent 10 years in kids, there was no way I was going to do anything that could be remotely competitive or conflict with what I, I had a lot of investment in, right? But that's actually how I started the discussions. And what they were doing right at that time was they were one of the examples of specialty brands that were trying to figure out this new world of Amazon, this new world of what we would both call uberfication or um, decentralization, where the bigger getting bigger and the smaller smaller, but not much in the middle. And that's kind of the era we've been in since around that 2008, 9 and 10 period. And it's only accelerated. And David Jaffe, who was the CEO and, and, and found, um, leader of that, was had a thesis. How can we build great brands at the brand level and give them leverage at the channel level that starts to put a platform together. And it was, is there a different business model here? And I was intrigued enough with his intellectual hypothesis. And I thought, you know what? I could go do something really different. And the good news for me, it would be a chance since my Nike days to go back to very big numbers and to look at data at a much bigger set because I'd been in a growth mode for so long and I wouldn't have to fundraise, which would be nice. So Fast forward to, I took it on, we did a couple big brands, the brands I built or accelerated, you could say, or digitized and brought forward in the world were very successful and we sold to private equity and they asked if I would come work on other brands with them and I said, you know, I think I came into that with all due respect to that team feeling like I was going into turnaround and I don't think most people there thought we were in a turnaround. And so I, it was educational to me to realize really quickly that I really love to build and I'm better as a leader where there's a shared view of change going on. Um, and that business did need that kind of change. And if I'm going to do that kind of change, I'd probably rather do it as a build than a turnaround. So that was kind of how it ended for me. Okay. Uh, very uh, interesting, you know, differences. Uh, you know, I, I, I made a comment to you uh, as we were prepping, you know, some people's careers are very prescriptive. They've kind of planned it out. Is that how you thought about your career? No, <laughs> I think career for me, well, first of all, I'm humble enough from my roots that I always had to earn it. And so I always thought about it as feeding my family, having shelter, taking care of the people I love. There's a practicality lens to it. But I also really grew up with the center of my world is my family, my husband, I'm a mother, and so there were times throughout my career where I made adjustments or decisions that had to do with the right thing for that part of my family, it wasn't necessarily my career. 
And then, but I was never willing to give up the true passion for me, which is I love building and I actually believe in it commercially more than I do in a lot of the nonprofit things I've done, because I think to have the biggest impact, it has to be opted in by people willing to pay money. But I don't think that it can't be done without a Maslow's hierarchy and that you can't actually do things better in the world. So for me, that itch has just always been strong and I have always been willing to seek out scratching it. And when I didn't get it, I was willing to leave. So even when I didn't know what that meant, that has been my constant theme. But you are very polite in saying some people who are very, don't see my, don't know my world will look at it and say, oh, it's kind of ADD, like a lot of different industries, a lot of different moves. I was places a very long time. So it wasn't that I didn't hang around for cycles, but if you're actually in a growth business, like a lot of venture capitalists look at my background and even like what I'm doing now, and they're kind of my people, they will say exactly the skills you need because you have to see across industries to see patterns if you're going to disrupt. I actually have a very strong, or I would say less atypical and pretty typical venture growth to PE growth background. And that's because it's all about pattern and levers before you have an established industry. But that was accidental. I didn't know that. I didn't go into that building that. That's just sort of what I gravitated to naturally and where I would sort of view my skill set today. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, they've helped 13 of their customers get acquired, with one selling for nearly $800 million and one that IPO'd recently. Plus, they were ranked as the 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. If you're an e-commerce business that needs help scaling your ads profitably, check them out at element.com, spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T dot com. Part of the reason I love doing uh, this podcast and I'm approaching a uh, hundred shows coming up uh, in the next few months uh, since I started this is that I get to learn about things that I have no idea what they were and sweet proteins is right on that list. So tell us about Ubli, tell us about how you got there and what sweet proteins are and how as a consumer listeners would know about sweet proteins. It's pretty, it's more typical than not that nobody's ever heard of sweet proteins because what I'm doing right now is tip of the spear of innovation, right? So here I'll give a little history lesson on what's happening around biotech because technically I'm not just in technology now, it's the first time I've ever been in biotech, right? But the reality is in the last 10 years, a lot of the technology tools that we were developing the 30 years before that are now being applied to the natural world in ways to get after tackling some of our big problems, climate, health being the chief ones on top of it, right? But also food scarcity and how we're going to make food supply available in a world where the population is growing and the resources won't necessarily grow at the same rate, right? So those are kind of big themes that are happening across biotech. I personally had made the decision to get back into healthy living and technology. So there's this one category within it that's particularly interesting to me called food is medicine, where there are a bunch of innovations happening as a result of, if you might have heard in the news, CRISPR, the CRISPR technology and biotechnology that kind of changed our ability to understand the DNA of a lot of plant um, life. And what is happening now with AI is, is the ability to get at those databases and do comparisons in the natural world in ways we've never been able to do, right? So it's, it's moving at very, very quick speed. Well, in the middle of all of this, what we're tackling is focused on obesity and diabetes. And my, my footnote back is when I left Asina and decided I needed to stay in Minneapolis, my son was still in high school. I wanted to get back into venture. Everything there is about health care tech. So I, for a couple of years, I sat as the chief consumer officer on top of health care tech, which means I sat on top of all the data of American consumers. And really stressful to me was to see that the average person over 65 in this country is on six or seven medications now. And a lot of that seems like a path to nowhere. There's no one silver bullet. It's not as simple as saying everything's wrong in food or everything's wrong in healthcare or everything's wrong because we all sit on the couch too much and look at digital things. It's complicated. There's a complicated set of factors here. But one of the things we do know is when we look at a couple of the macro indicators, obesity and diabetes are just out of whack in the world and we're having metabolic failures at rates. And I got really intrigued with that when I was in healthcare. So when I stepped over and said, you know, but I 
when I'm in healthcare, I don't really get to do my consumer brand itch. There's no woo with the consumer. I'm kind of sitting in the middle with insurance. Nobody likes their insurance. Um, so I love the data, but I want to get where I can have it more preventative and brand approach, which is what brought me to Ubly. So fast forward to what Ubly is. Ubly, I met a bunch of scientists who'd been seven years into R&D. They had top tier venture capitalists. They were looking for somebody that could think about what's the consumer prop? How do you bring this to the consumer? But what were they so excited about? Well, there's these plants that have grown up along the equator that have solved this really interesting problem for us where they only work on apes, gorillas, and humans, but they're a protein that acts as a trickster, trickster sugar. Meaning when we eat something with sugar, metabolically, every sugar we have out in the market, except for sweet proteins today is what's called a small molecule. And they hit our bloodstream. And then they of course interact with our insulin and our blood sugar levels. And then they hit our gut microbiome. And that's just biologically what small molecules do. Um, but when we experience the sweetness, it's actually on our tongue. It's what we call our T1 and R2 taste receptors. These plants who needed to figure out a way to have a mobile species spread their seed, but couldn't afford the calories or along the equator, of evolving to actually carry more carbohydrates, it's expensive caloric load for them as a plant. They figured out one little protein could bind momentarily on that part of your taste bud and tell your brain, hey, I just got sweets. But then like any protein, when you swallow it, it moves through your body as a protein, which doesn't affect your blood sugar, your insulin levels, or hit your gut microbiome. Now think about that, brand, marketing, whatever, step back and say, wow, that's a kind of big solve, right? A lot of people have been trying to figure out how do we have how do we satisfy our biologically normal sweet tooth? Like we're all designed to love sweets. That's how we survived, right? With this overabundance that's now available in our, our diet, which by the way, is also we produce too much. So it's becoming a big climate problem too. How, how do we solve that? Well, what if proteins could be a pathway that is a game changer for the health? That's what we're doing with sweet proteins. Um, when I got there, we didn't have any with regulatory approval. As of about a week ago, we have four that have passed all safety and toxicology standards. We launched our first products about six months ago. It's the first time the world's ever eaten sweet protein powered um, treats. And um, we're in the middle of building that where a lot of what we're trying to do is build the education and I would say the zeitgeist around why proteins could be something you could trust and they could give you your sweet tooth in a way that's a game changer for your body. So I'm thinking, you know, you're talking about proteins. This is very novice of me. I'm thinking I can eat a piece of chicken and make it taste like chocolate and give give me that uh, <laughs> that thought. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, my dad passed away at a young age uh, because of diabetes. Uh, that's uh, something that I, I watch myself. Um, thank God I don't have it, but, you know, something that I protect myself against. Really interesting. You, you mentioned, you used the terminology tip of the spear, and then, you know, you really are you know, starting an entire category, something that people didn't understand. How do you go about doing that, spreading the word? Well, you have a lot of experience in this, you know. This actually harkens back so much to my Nike lessons because in many ways they created the category of thinking we need different shoes for different sports, right? Before that, they were all just called sneakers, anything with rubber on the bottom. And they created the category that we now think of as sports equipment, sports shoes, a lot of what I was doing at Giggle was that. Cool here is, in some ways, figuring out sugar alternatives is not new. It's old, old industry, right? We've been trying to figure out alternatives to sugar for 30 years. We just don't really like the taste of them. What we've never done, though, is had a protein sweetener. We think of protein as loading and building muscle, but protein can do more, right? So the category opportunities to say, this notion of sweet protein, even those words together, most people have to pause on. I usually have to say it two or three times, like sweet, like a protein is a protein, like a sugar that acts like a protein, a, a, you know, a protein that acts like a sugar, like it's a novel combination to put together. And in that, there is this really great opportunity to define the category of a pathway to giving us sweetness that is a very different mechanism of action for our body and therefore the game changer on the health proposition. I also think it's incumbent upon us to, and I'll talk a little bit about how then I'm going about it, because when you look at the consumer data around sweeteners, if I had to give a singular headline, it's that consumers are lost in the sauce, right? They, they can't follow the bouncing ball of NFPs, of what's the back of their ingredients, of which one's good for them. They were told this was good 10 years ago. Now this one isn't. Um, so there's a lot of sense of bait and switch, too good to be true, um, distrust that's going on. So when I look at that and say, that's what I have to solve, I come back and say, all right, so I have to get out with 
at the end of the day, it's food. I think we would all agree tasting is believing, right? So the first most important hurdle is how much of anything are you going to replace in your diet if it doesn't taste good? So my first initiative is build products so that people can eat it. If, even if someday I'm going to make this available mostly as an ingredient, because they can't eat an ingredient, they can start eating food and I need to trial. So a huge part of what I did last summer is give away. I think we gave away 25, 30,000 cans of teas. Now we're in the middle of giving away chocolate samples for Valentine's. I mean, it's really about taste, 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 because once they're tasting and say, this tastes good, I have permission to then start to say, why is it so much better, right? Why is it better? And so the one, two is why we're getting out with trial. We're trying to build a brand equity, kind of like we did with Giggle, like to your earlier points where there's a sense of permission, permissible indulgence. There's something here that's good. The last thing I want to be is another lecturing solution, another sacrifice diet program, right? I want to say, hey, actually, this is kind of all win. You're like get in it, try in it, enjoy it. I don't really want to create a sweets business that isn't about celebration. That's kind of the antithesis of sweets, right? Sweets are about celebration. So it's to build that positivity around it. And that is me then on the sideline building a lot of content. So whether it's spending time with people like you in this format, whether it's building our SEO strategies about where are people who are trying to solve the problem of diabetes and obesity going to look, what's coming up so they get educated, um, we have a ton of deep, long tail content creation going on, really backed by experts. So we have an incredible scientific advisory board. Um, we have incredible technologists and they're out doing education. That's what we do a lot of right now. That's not how we front up front talk about it with consumers because we first think you got to taste it and think it tastes good and it's got to be fun. Then we think we have permission to say, and this is why this is so different. And this is why this is so important. Um, and that's a long-term slow build that we're six months in on. I have a lot to do still. So interesting. Um, where can folks uh, buy some of the products that you guys have developed? We are, so we launched this summer, mostly with an LA lot. We're very online. So of course you can get it at oobly.com, O-O-B-L-I.com. We're of course in marketplaces. You get us on Amazon. Um, we'll, we'll be in the next about six weeks in about I don't know, I think it's three dozen marketplaces. So a lot of people's favorite places to get it digitally. We are in about a hundred doors in LA because we didn't really launch wholesale. Actually, my head of wholesale sales just started last Monday. <laughs> so we're in about a hundred doors based on our LA market launch because we did a lot of independence. Um, but we're in places like Jade's Market, that there's eight of in LA. And we just really went to one place where we could do a lot of sampling. We showed up just as much at movie night on Saturday night in LA to Laurel Canyon hikes. And we had people try teas. And we had a lot of interest from retailers pick it up because of that. We're just now beginning to roll it out nationally in retailers. And I would expect you'll see places in the fall. But if you sign up on our website, we do, you can sign up just to be in the news on where we show up, what our new products are, where it is. I encourage people to do that if you want to know when it's near you. Um, in the meantime, we do lots of free sampling. So I encourage people to try it out and experience your first ever sweet protein powered product. So look, uh, we're down to the end of the show. This was great. Thank you. Uh, I do this uh, two minute drill, seven questions, one word answer. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay, a brand that you admire or that inspires you? I still love Nike. Once you bleed a swoosh, you always bleed a swoosh. Okay, favorite app on your phone? Uh, my Delta app. Last website other than Amazon that you shopped from? <laughs> Can I say Oobly? Sure. I did just send out, we launched chocolates this week, so I just sent a lot of chocolates to people. Um, but I'm actually also a regular Thrive Market shopper. Something that you're not good at, but wish that you were? Singing. Charitable organization that you're passionate about. Worldwide Orphans. I've been involved for a long time. If you had one superpower, what would it be? To speak any language in the world. And other than family, what's your most prized possession? I would have said until recent years, my horse, but he kind of counts as family and I don't have him anymore. So <laughs> it's probably my wedding band. It means a lot to me. And it was That's passed nice. down. Very nice. And where can people reach out to you on social media or other places to connect with you? I'm Allie Wing. My name is super easy to spell, A-L-I-W-I-N-G. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on X. I'm on Instagram. It's all under Allie Wing. Awesome. Well, look, uh, thanks for the time. I really enjoyed catching up. And, uh, you know, the work that you're doing uh, with Sweet Proteins and Oobly is, uh, is really good. And um, hopefully you're going to be able to save a lot of people 
uh, heartache with illness and, and other things. So uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a big, it's a big vision and we're swinging for the fences to really help people with obesity and diabetes. But uh, that's the thing that motivates me to get up every day. Well, that's great. All right. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Allie Wing for coming on the marketing playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, you can go back to school. I'm often asked about the value of giving up a job and going back to school. Of course, this needs to be a personal decision, but in some cases, being able to pause a professional career and continue education can be really helpful. In Allie's case, not only did she leave a job, she took on two degrees at once, and in her case, she believes that it helped her career tremendously. Number two, Think brand first, not channel. A great call out from Allie. She speaks about how in her roles, she's thought about the brand first, its role in the market you're serving, how best to optimize the message for the customer, and how to grow its awareness. She thinks of the channel simply as tools to help extend the brand into the market in which you're trying to sell. And number three, you can be an entrepreneur and then go back to corporate. This also fits with the message of don't be afraid to fail. There were many aspects of how Allie came to start Giggle and to ultimately move back into her corporate role. She loved her time at Giggle, but when the time was right, she took on a new role with larger numbers, as she said, in a more corporate environment. It helped her round out her experience and get her ready for her time at Oobly, where she's helping to establish an entirely new product category. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Until next time, the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm.